Hi there. This is Colin McGarry with Walking D-Day. And today we're into Totalize, Operation Totalize. Now we're here on Hill 67, just south of Caen. And this was captured by the Canadians in July. After weeks of stalemate, the British Canadians had taken Caen in Operation Goodwood on the 19th of July. The Americans broke out from around saint lo on the 25th of July in Operation Cobra. On the same day, General Simmons launched Operation Spring to take the Verrier Ridge, which is just over there. The Germans took two days to realise that Operation Cobra was the main operation, and during that time they concentrated on stopping the Canadian breakout from Calm. So Operation Spring turned into a bloody operation for the Canadians. General Dempsey had followed this with Operation Bluecoat to break out from the Comont Levante area on the 30th of July. And now General Simmons was to launch Operation Totalize in two phases to break out from the Khan region and then that would be followed by Tractable to get to Falaise. By coincidence, Operation Totalize started on the same time as Operation Lutich, which was a German counterattack through Mortain towards Avranches. Now, General Simmons didn't realize that the Germans had pulled out many troops from this area, plus tanks, to attack Mortain. The operation was to start at 11 p.m. on the 7th of August. Now, Simmons took the unusual choice to make a night attack to get the advantage of surprise. They had no night sights like today, so to make up for that, he would have searchlights shine on the clouds which would light up the land. There would also be Bofors guns firing tracer shells in the direction they were to roll. Another innovation was to take M7 self-propelled guns and convert them into troop carriers, which he called kangaroos. There was an operation of the 2nd Canadian Corps. Now the Canadians didn't have enough men to carry out the mission. And so with the 2nd Infantry Division and the 2nd Armoured Division, the 51st British Division was added on with the 33rd Armoured Brigade and the Poles were also arriving to assist. They had 500 tanks, 700 artillery pieces, and 2,000 bombers at their disposal. Now, the 21st Panzer had been pulled out and replaced by the 272nd Division, and the 12th SS had been pulled back in reserve and replaced by the 89th Division. Now the plan was quite simple, as plans are. The difficult bit was putting it into execution. Now the, the start line was saint andre Thion, which is just here, to Solier, which is to the east of us. Practically the positions that the British and Canadians were at the end of Operation Goodwood on the 19th of July. The phase one objective was Hill 122, which is that way, and then St. Aignan de Cremenil, further to the east. Now the tanks would push through the German defences to their objectives, and then the follow-up troops, the uh, marching infantry, would take the towns they bypassed, Maison, Fontenay le Marmion, and Tilly le Compagne. Now the objective for phase two was the high ridge just north of Falaise. Now the importance of these ridges can be seen if you drive from Falaise to Caen on a fine day. On the road just near Saint Quentin, you can see the Caen Hospital, which is 19 miles away. Now the land looks flattish, but in fact the road now dips and we don't see the Khan Hospital again until we get near Hill 122 
which is 13 miles to the north. Now from Hale 67 we get a good view of the past battles and the future battle. Now to the west as Hill 112 that was the objective for Operation Epsom it was finally taken on August 4th a few days before Operation Total Eye started and looking north we can see of course Khan and the hospital which we can see from miles away now looking south over there we can see Beauvoir Farm and with Trotval, that was the start line for the Canadians. From there, that to go up the Verrier Ridge, which is to the south of that. And then just below us here, he sent Andre, and just past it, Maison. So that was the mission for the infantry to clear up. The tanks were bypassing that. And you can see the uh, building to the right which is on top of the mines there were iron mines at Maison and further to the left was Fontenay Le Marmium the 33rd Armoured Brigade would advance from the start line accompanied by the 51st Highlanders in Kangaroos they were heading for saint aignan de Cremenil. the Canadian armour would head for Hale 122 and Kaiwe. These armoured and motorised troops wouldn't stop for anything. Foot soldiers would follow and clear out any resistance nests. General O'Connor had seen the need for armoured personnel carriers during Goodwood. The idea had been vetoed by Dempsey. Tanks need to go fast and they can't take objectives alone. They need infantry. Simmons had some 105 priests or self propelled guns on loan from the Americans. He got permission to adopt them. He had a week to strip out the guns and fill in the holes. Each kangaroo could carry 10 men at the same speed as a tank. Simmons didn't use pre-attack bombing, but bombing the flanks of the attack. There was a rolling barrage to clear the way. Both of his guns would fire green tracer shells over the troops to show them the way to go. That was phase one. For phase two, Simmons did use a pre-attack bombing raid carried out by the Americans. Now the German 89th Division was holding the line from La Hogue to May sur orne Along the east bank of the River Orne, the 271st was stationed. On the 6th of August, the British 53rd and 59th Divisions crossed the river near Le Brieux, supported by the 107th REC Battalion. The high land on the British side was higher than the German side, so the British had the advantage. Kampfgruppwunsch is sent to counter the incursion. They are attacked by 54 bombers. The 12th SS was supposed to be in reserve, but they were called to repel the British incursion. Before they could do anything, it was realised that a large-scale attack was being launched from the Khan area. The German forces had 20 Panzer IVs, 20 Jagdpanzer IVs and 8 Tigers and some Brumbars, all under the command of Sept Dietrich of the 1st Panzer Corps. Ken Tout was a gunner in the Sherman with the North Ants Yeomanry. He's written several great books about the Battle of Normandy. Each troop had three Shermans with 75mm guns and one Firefly. The Firefly 17-pounder gun could knock out a tiger. They started at Cormel, which at the time was a village outside Caen. They were in the tank at 2100 hours and started to move at 2145. Ken can see the kangaroos behind and the Firefly in front. At 2240, Ken gets out to check that their tail lights are working. They keep to narrow columns to go through the paths cleared by the flail tanks. The driver asks to open his hatch. He puts on goggles to see out directly. If Ken fires a gun, he will have to duck down. The commander indicates to Ken to come up to the hatch, so they have two pairs of eyes out looking around. He can't even shout above the bombing on the flanks. 
They come up to a Sherman wedged in a hedge. An officer shouts to find another way through. They give Ken a lit cigarette so they can see him and he and the co-driver go ahead. They find a gap and beckon the tanks to come through. Their machine guns open up and shells come in and then they stop. At 1.30 they hear reports of German tanks being hit and see a Sherman of Troop 2 go up. They are fired on from the left. Ken traverses and fires high explosives. The tank has turned towards the target. At one point, he's re-traversed to the right. He sees a young, terrified German in a trench looking up at him. He couldn't lower the gun that much, but if he'd fired, the blast would have killed him. At 2.35, they get a message that the lead tank has arrived at the objective. By 3 a.m., 60 tanks are lined up by a hedge codename Fly By Night. After a pause... With time to get out and stretch the legs, they start moving through the hedge and told to fire at will. Dozens of tanks firing at will. Apparently no reply. Then a web of work for fires and is fired on by several tanks. A German SP pulls out. Now the Black Watch move in to hold the village. The four columns of Canadian tanks started between Trotval, which is here, and Beauvoir Farm, which is just up there. The objective was to take Hill 122, Cayue, and the quarry to the southwest. They rumbled up the hill towards Verrier, which hadn't been taken in Operation Spring, and they soon caught up with the rolling barrage, and they followed it at six miles per hour. August was very dry and the tanks threw up a lot of dust. This made navigation difficult and broke up the columns. At one point, Sergeant Kitchen of Fort Gary Horse got out of his tank and climbed up on another one to ask the men what unit they were in. When they said Northampton Yeomanry, he knew he'd strayed a long way to the left. Now that's Rock and Core down there. Going round Rock and Core added to the chaos. Captain Harvey was in a kangaroo and he found themselves going through Rock and Core instead of going round it. At one point he shouted to the driver, Keep to the right, you're going to scrape the wall on the left. The driver shouted back, We're already scraping the wall on the right. And Captain Harvey put his hand out and he felt the steel of a German tank going past. He saw the cross on it to confirm that. So they were lost as well. Now we're here on Hill 122, 122, 90 metres. Now the Royals coming through Rock and Core. They were supposed to debus and the infantry were to come up here to attack the hill. They can see the railway line down there on the embankment. And they missed the passage through there. So they had to go back and skirt around the north of it. This led to the commander changing the plan. And instead of debussing, the kangaroos brought the infantry up here. They just rolled up in no opposition. And the infantry took the next 25 minutes to clear out the light opposition. Then they started digging in, because he knew the Germans were going to counterattack. Now, once they dug in, Daylight was coming, and they could look backwards and see uh, Khan and realise that the Germans had been surveying every move they made since Operation Goodwood. The counterattack happened at nine o'clock. The Germans attacking straight up the main road. A panther broke through the outer defences and advanced until it was knocked out and then the Germans started retreating. So they held Hill 122. The 6th Canadian Brigade was to take Maison, fontenay le marmion and Roquencourt, which would all be bypassed by the army. The bombing on the flanks had barely touched Fontenay and May, so they were nest the resistance from the 89th Division. The Fusiliers Mont Royal 
were to take May. The only armour support was from some crocodile flamethrowers. The cameras attacked Fontenay, and despite stiff but barely commanded resistance, held the town by morning. So many officers had been killed that B Company was commanded by CSM Arbor. At one point, the Germans were about to overrun Company B's position. CSM Arbor led a counterattack, and the Germans panicked and fled. Arbor received the military cross. May was a harder nut to crack. Lieutenant Colonel Gavril made two unsuccessful attacks, being pushed back to St André. The third attack was assisted by crocodile tanks. The infantry had to improvise on how to support them, as they had no training in, in tank support. After at first resisting, the Germans started retreating at the first sight of the flamethrowers. The second phase of total life had started before May was secured. Now the Black Watch moved in to clear the village. Now after taking the village, Ken Tout and the North Ants Yeomanry took up positions just south of the village. Ken's tank went down this lane. There was a gully, then woods on the other side. Firing came from the woods, but the Germans didn't advance. Some tanks that advanced down the gully got knocked out. Then Michael Whitman had a meeting with Muller and Mayor at Santo, which is where we are. Now from just north of Santo, Mayor had seen the mass tanks of the Canadians and he wondered why they weren't advancing. But he'd seen a bomber dropping flares, so he judged that there was going to be a bombing raid. So Kampfgruppe Waldemuller was sent north to get out the way of the bombing and to counterattack the Canadians. And they were led by the four Tigers of Michael Whitman. Now the North Ants Yeomanry could see them coming from saint aignan de Cremenil. Joe Aikins was in a firefly with his 17 pounder gun and he started firing at the Tigers. He probably knocked out three. For Michael Whitman's, which was the furthest away, was hit probably by the Canadians who were in the grounds of the um, Chateau of Gourmenil. And they were the Sherbrooke Fusiliers led by Radley Waters. So that's where Michael Whitman's tank was destroyed. So in 10 minutes, half the Tiger tanks available to the Germans had been destroyed and they contributed nothing to the battle. Now the famous action of Michael Whitman at Villa Bocage and his demise here at uh, Gourmenil. I've, I've covered that in another video and the link is just here. The Canadian 4th Armoured Division and the Polish 1st Armoured Division were to pass through the troops already advanced and head to Falaise. And this time it was going to have pre-attack bombing. It was going to be carried out by the Americans. Now the Poles were hastening to their start line and they were bombed. 24 of the 680 planes dropped their bombs short. The Poles had many casualties and lost tanks. The surviving tanks carried on towards Saint-Aignan de Cremenil. And most of them went to the east of Saint-Aignan. They went down to the gully. The North Ants couldn't tell them that there were German tanks just down there. Problem of language. And the Poles had a different code name for objectives to the Canadians and the British. They didn't know that uh, Waldemuller had placed his tanks behind hedges just past the ravine of Del de la Roque. In a few minutes, the Poles lost 40 tanks. So they retreated to regroup at Saint-Aignan. So totalized two had started, 
and that'd be covered in another video. A totalized one was a success. Using the night attack, which surprised the Germans, it kept the British and Canadian casualties to a minimum. But it had been a big gamble. The tanks moving in the column, followed by the troops in their troop carriers, were moving fast, but they were very vulnerable. If the Germans had been more on the ball, it could have been a catastrophe.